Welcome back to our study of 1 Kings. We are in 1 Kings chapter 18. We'll be looking at verses 1 to 19. And this passage is going to set up for us the famous showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal that's coming later in chapter 18. But before we get there, we need this setup. We need this scene or set of scenes that tell us about the coming end of the drought and the coming confrontation between Elijah the prophet and Ahab the king of Israel. So look with me as we look at 1 Kings chapter 18 verses 1 to 19. It says, After many days the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, and when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself, and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. So this chapter begins with God telling Elijah to go meet with Ahab and that he is going to bring an end to the drought. Remember earlier, God told Elijah to tell Ahab about the drought that was coming. And this drought was coming as a result of Ahab's sin, his idolatry. God had warned his people back in Deuteronomy 28 that if they forsook his covenant, if they did not keep his laws then there were a series of curses that would come upon them. And one of them was the curse of drought. And Ahab was a notorious idolater, married to a notorious idolater. And as a result of Ahab's sin, God has brought a drought upon the land. In fact, at this point, that drought appears, uh, has likely lasted three years. That's probably what uh, is being referred to when it says uh, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. That's probably the third year of the drought. So God spoke to Elijah, told him to go reveal himself to Ahab, and he said, and I will send rain upon the earth. So he's going to bring an end to this drought. Now, uh, Ahab, what is Ahab doing at this point? Well, Ahab is trying to find water for the animals. The drought is so severe that the king is concerned that some of his own animals are going to die. And if anybody in the land has water, it's going to be the king, right? So the king is concerned that some of his animals are going to die. So he calls uh, Obadiah, who's over the king's household, and he says, you go one way, I'll go another way, and let's see if we can't find some water so that some of these animals will live. So uh, verse 2, at the end of verse 2, it tells us the drought was very severe in Samaria. That's Samaria's part of the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, and so the drought has been awful. Uh, it's reached a crisis point. And Ahab is, again, concerned for the welfare of his animals, even as Elijah is about to come and meet with Ahab and bring an end to the drought. So uh, what's going to happen when Elijah comes to meet with Ahab? Well, let's see what happens next. Verse 7. And as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go, tell your lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, How have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you. And when they would say, He is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they had not found you. And now you say, Go, tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I have gone from you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you, I know not where. 
And so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Let's pause there for just a moment. So Elijah appears to Obadiah, who again is over the king's household. And Obadiah recognizes Elijah. He says, is that you, my Lord Elijah? And uh, Elijah wants Obadiah to go tell King Ahab that Elijah is here. He wants him to set up the meeting, in other words. But Obadiah is dismayed by that idea because he just knows that if he goes and tells Ahab that he's seen Elijah, then the Spirit of God is going to carry Elijah away somewhere, and Ahab is going to kill Obadiah. Uh, so, and, and we learn something here in this, in this story. The, the story of Elijah, as we have been reading it in 1 Kings, has been relatively quiet so far. Uh, Elijah tells the king about the coming drought. God provides for Elijah through ravens by a brook. Then he sends Elijah to stay with a widow, and God miraculously provides for the widow and her son and for Elijah. When the son dies, uh, Elijah pleads with the Lord, and the son is restored to life. But what we didn't know is that apparently throughout that time, Ahab has been seeking Elijah all over the place, trying to find him, wondering where he is, going from nation to nation, asking them if Elijah is there, asking, asking them, calling upon them to swear an oath that he's not there if they say they have not seen him. And so there's been a hunt going on for Elijah we didn't know anything about until this point. And one of the things that that part of the story teaches us and shows us is how faithfully God has been not only providing for Elijah, as we saw in chapter 17, but also protecting Elijah, as we're now made aware in chapter 18, that God has been shielding him from King Ahab, even though we didn't realize the serious manhunt that was going on for Elijah. And, you know, one thing we could say is that's true of our lives as well, that oftentimes we don't even know all the things that God is doing for our good. We don't even know all the ways that he's protecting us, Right? that he is at work uh, on our behalf to do good for us, oftentimes in ways that we aren't even aware, don't even realize we need that God is working for our good. So God's been protecting Elijah, preserving Elijah, and so uh, Obadiah uh, is concerned that if he goes and tells the king that he's found Elijah, and then when he gets back, Elijah's not there, Obadiah's going to be in trouble. And notice he said at the end of verse 12, um, he says, Your servant uh, has feared the Lord from my youth. And, and then he goes on and says this. He says, verse 13, Has it not been told my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, Go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here and he will kill me. Now, here's something else we didn't know about. It was mentioned, parenthetically, earlier in, in this chapter, chapter 18. Um, but we don't find out about it until this chapter. And that is that Queen Jezebel, Ahab's wife, was uh, seeking to put prophets to death. Right? Has it not been told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? So Jezebel was slaughtering prophets and we've not been told about that story yet, but Obadiah tells us that was happening and that while it was happening, he stuck his neck out and rescued a hundred of the Lord's prophets, hid them in a cave in groups of 50, two groups of 50, and he provided for them, which would have been risky and dangerous and difficult even under normal circumstances. But if this was happening during the drought, which it doesn't say for certain, but if it was happening during the drought, that would have been even more difficult to provide for a hundred extra people without the king catching wind of what he was doing, undermining what the queen was seeking to do to apparently rid the land of the prophets of God. So later in chapter 19, Elijah is going to you know, famously say uh, 
essentially, I'm the only faithful one who's left, and God is going to say, no, I have a remnant of 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Well, it seems that in this moment, Elijah is meeting a member of that remnant, that Obadiah is a faithful servant of the Lord, that he is, he's uh, protected the Lord's prophets, he's feared the Lord from his youth, even though he's working for and serving a wicked king, Obadiah appears to be a God-fearing man, a godly man, a faithful man. And so one of the things that that reminds us is that we can't always tell where someone's allegiance lies by who they work for. They may be doing good even though they are working for someone who is doing evil. So if all we knew about Obadiah was that he was over the household of Ahab, we might think, ooh, that guy's probably just as crooked as Ahab is. But when we actually find out about Obadiah's story, we learn that he's not crooked like Ahab. He's not unfaithful. He is taking risks to honor the Lord, right? So that's important to note. So what does Elijah say? Verse 15, it says, And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today, that is to Ahab the king. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. So Elijah assures Obadiah that he is going to meet with Ahab that very day. And so Obadiah goes to set up the meeting between Ahab and Elijah. Now this first part of uh, this meeting is brief. But man, is it good and significant. Verse 17 says, When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? You've probably heard that phrase before, right? You troubler of Israel. Ahab looks at Elijah and he blames Elijah for Israel's problems. Specifically, we would assume he has in mind the drought, right? That Ahab thinks Elijah is the one who has gotten Israel in trouble, or Elijah is the one who has brought trouble upon Israel. What is absolutely backwards and wrong about that is that the drought has come as a result of Ahab's sin, not as a result of anything Elijah has done. Elijah is mainly the messenger. He is speaking on behalf of the Lord, but it's the Lord who said, To Israel, if you don't keep my covenant, I'm going to bring a drought. Elijah just said, hey, it's coming. And now it's come upon Israel. And Ahab looks at Elijah and says, you're the problem here. You're the troubler of Israel. But Elijah answers, verse 18, it says, And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Elijah says, I'm not the troubler of Israel. You're the one who brought trouble on Israel. You and your father's house, his uh, father was Omri, who was also a wicked king. Ahab is the one who's brought trouble on Israel through his sin. Elijah is not to blame, but Ahab is. And what is happening is a fulfillment of God's word, not something that Elijah himself either came up with or brought to pass by his own power. No, Elijah, again, is just the instrument and the messenger of the Lord. Now, Ahab is not alone in pointing the finger in the wrong direction. Sometimes a person can be so blind to their own sins and faults that they think that all their troubles come from those who point out their sins instead of realizing it is their sins that have brought them trouble. Don't blame the bearer of bad news when you brought the bad news on yourself. That's what Ahab is here to warn us about, right? If somebody is doing something wrong and suffering the consequences, and then, uh, you know, a pastor who may not even know what's going on in that person's life 
preaches a sermon and says, you know, if, if you do this, this is, this is what God's word says is going to happen. Then they get mad at the preacher as though it's the preacher's fault that they're suffering the consequences for their sins. That's the kind of thing that Ahab is doing. And to be honest, to a certain degree, we're all prone to do this. We all want to shift the blame at, at a minimum, right? We want to say it's somebody else's fault. That's been true since the Garden of Eden. Well, it was the serpent. Well, it was the woman that you gave me, right? We are all prone to shift the blame. And we may be prone even to point the finger at the person who is trying to help us by telling us where the problem is rather than uh, acknowledging that the problem starts with us. So don't be like Ahab and condemn the messenger who says, you've brought the trouble on yourself, or this is what God says the consequence is going to be if you persist in that sin. Instead, receive that message as a kindness from God who's warning you and giving you a chance to repent. Right Now, the last thing we read there in verse 19 is Elijah saying this, Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. That's the last portion of the setup of the famous showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. I'm looking forward to looking into that story with you next time, Lord willing. Until then, God bless.